morning I would have you open your Bibles again to John chapter 3. And as I've prefaced with every message, there will be some overlap in this, and it's, and it's a necessary overlap. So this morning the text is going to come from John chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. John chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, and you can follow along as I read this. Let's stand together in honor of God's Word. If you're able to stand, please stand with us as we, as we read this text to, to honor the Word of God this morning. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Let's pray. Father, we know to understand these things, they are spiritually discerned. We learn a great lesson from Nicodemus That mere religion does not give us insight into the truth of your Scripture. It allows us to know it, even accept it in an intellectual way. But Lord, we want it in our hearts. We want it planted deeply within us that it might be watered and produce fruit to the glory of your name, for the benefit of our souls, for the sanctification of us being made more like Christ. And so, Father, we pray Your blessings upon Your Word as it has been read. Now, bless it, Lord, and the teaching aspect, and we pray, Holy Spirit, You come and You teach and You open our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Please be seated. So as we continue on in John chapter 3, we have a permissive eavesdropping in the conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus. We have great insight into into what's going on to be sort of the fly on the wall as Nicodemus has already traveled through night and darkness, physical and spiritual, to spend time to sit with Jesus, but to be taught some incredible things, things that he had no idea he was going to seek out, things that he had no idea he was in need of. And I wanted to start in verse 6 because it does build a context for what we're going to be touching on that we haven't yet hit. And in verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. These things can't be confused. The spirit is never going to give birth to the flesh. So, if you are born again, if you are born of the spirit, and you're having fleshly moments... This is not from God. This is not from the Spirit. This is from our sin nature. That's what's going on there. We've got to fight against this stuff. We've got to battle against this stuff. Know that where that's coming from. The Spirit is not giving birth to the flesh. But conversely, the flesh is not giving birth to the Spirit or spiritual things. And as I thought about this, here's a great attempt of the flesh to give birth to the Spirit. You remember when Adam and Eve fell in the garden when they sinned, and you remember what their response was when they realized that they were naked and full of shame. Let's make fig leaves. Let's cover our our nakedness so that we can cover our shame. And thinking, okay, that's going to take away our sin against a holy God. And it didn't work. But it also goes a little bit deeper. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, you can turn there if you like, but I'm just going to hit on it real quick. This is what it would look like, I believe, if the flesh could give birth to the spiritual things. It says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And God doesn't even finish the sentence. It stops right there. It stops mid-flow. Because here's what would happen if in a fallen state they reached out and grabbed hold of that tree of life and ate of that fruit. They would be forever in a corrupted, sinful state. How horrific that would be. 
Because God is saying, if you eat of this, you're going to live forever, but you have fallen. You're dying. You now have a sin nature that you didn't have before. You have not yet tasted redemption. And so here you would forever be in this sense, in eternity, in a fallen state. Sounds like hell to me. And so God is prohibiting them from doing this because here's the the thing that we've learned through this text and we are learning from this text. You must be born again. You have to be. There's no other way around that. You need new life. I need new life in Christ. And that new life only comes by way of the Spirit. We've got to be born of the Spirit. The Spirit must give us life. I love the Word of God. I love how the Scripture says very clearly in Hebrews, it is living and active. Now, I don't know how many times I've read through the Gospel of John. It's, it's, I don't know, I'm not even going to try to count. Many times. And as you read through the Bible, maybe you've experienced this too. You know you've read a portion of Scripture, but then all of a sudden... A verse jumps out at you like you've never ever laid eyes on it. I keep thinking, God's inserting verses that weren't here in my Bible. He keeps putting them in there because I've never seen them before. But one of those verses that has jumped out upon me concerning our text is John chapter 6, verse 63. This really sums it up, what Jesus is saying here. And these are the words of Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 63. It says... It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. That really stings. That takes you right to what is going on here in the conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. No help. He's not saying it's a little help or you can kind of help the Spirit along. It's of no help at all. And that's what Jesus is trying to convey here to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you're a religious man. Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel. Nicodemus, you're you're high ranking in the Jewish social system. But that's not helping you at all. Nicodemus, you, and the you here becomes plural. So he's also talking to the Sanhedrin. He's also talking to the Pharisees. And friends, he's also talking to us. You must be born again. The flesh is of no help to you receiving eternal life. You don't earn it. You don't get it by good works. You don't get it by outweighing the good that you do in relation to the bad that you do, and then God's going to balance the scales out. It's never going to work. They'll never be balanced. Your sin will always be outweighed no matter how horrific the world may see it or not because sin is against a holy God. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. Because there was no other way. There was no other way for us to receive eternal life. And as we learned last week, we need that cleansing as well. We need that, that sprinkling of the water. We need that, our sins to be washed away. And so Jesus is continuing with His conversation. And we come to verse 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't marvel at this, Nicodemus. Don't marvel at the necessity of rebirth. Because honestly, to marvel at the necessity of rebirth, in the sense of, do I really have to be born again? What that is truly is to deny that we're sinful creatures, because we are. And when we are grossly aware of our sin nature and our sin against the Holy God, we begin to realize, I've got to be born again. There's no other way around it. I'm not going to be good enough. I'm not going to be worthy enough of salvation. But it's also to marvel at the fact that we have to be born again. It's almost to dilute the work of the cross. Because if you look at how holy and perfect Jesus was, that is in direct proportion, contrastly to how sinful we are. Jesus wasn't just a perfect human that lived a perfect life. That's impossible. Jesus was divine and human and lived a perfect life. And here's the thing about Jesus. While He was tempted in the sense that He had to undergo all the temptations that we undergo and be victorious over those, the temptation really wasn't going to anchor itself in Jesus. He's divine. He had no sin nature. 
But He went through all of that for us so that He could die on the cross for our sins so that He would be buried and raised again and now in heaven as our high priest who understands what we're going through through temptation, through trial and tribulation and struggle. And so as Jesus says to Nicodemus, don't marvel that I said you've got to be born again. I make the same plea to you today. Don't marvel at this because it, there's no other way. It has to be done. But then we get to verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, that word wind and that word spirit in the Greek are the same word, pneuma. Now, you may think, well, I've never heard of that. You've heard of pneumonia? How do you spell pneumonia? What's it start with? A P. And so does pneuma. You've heard of pneumatic tools. That's where we get this from the Greek pneuma. It means wind and it means spirit. And really what Jesus is doing on some level is he's, he's teaching a parable. Because a parable, again, is an earthly lesson, something, something very tangible, something that we know about that has a spiritual implication. And so he's making reference to the wind but he's really talking about the Holy Spirit. That's what's happening here. And so keep that in mind. And it's Billy Graham who, who said, and he's been recorded of saying that, and it's rather amazing. He says, have you ever seen the wind? Have you ever seen the wind? I'll ask you that. Have you ever seen it? You haven't. You've seen the effects of the wind. You see the trees blow. And I think often if you've ever seen either in a movie which is fabricated but even on some sort of video a dust storm that kicks up and you see the dust cloud building and building and you know there's a strong wind coming you only know that because the dust that's kicking up. You don't see the wind. You see the effects of the wind. And as Billy Graham says there's a mystery to it. And there is. You can hear it. There's power. There's force. We try to block it, don't we? We live in houses, don't we? (laughs) We build up barricades. Even ships that have sails, they try to harness the wind. But you can't control it. You truly cannot control it. The moment you think you have it under control, it'll blow your house down. You don't control the wind. The Holy Spirit's the same way. You don't control Him. He's God. He has his own desires. He's moving in accordance to his will. You don't control him. I can't control him. And there's such great proof in this because there are countries throughout the ages who have tried to block him out. I think of China. China says, no, no church. No Christian evangelism, no Bibles. And what happens? It doesn't work. The church in China doesn't just exist. It flourishes. It grows. It's real. It's solid. You try to control the Holy Spirit and He'll show you just about how much control you really have. God is in control. And even Paul in his ministry, and it relates this in Acts chapter 16, the Holy Spirit forbid him from preaching the Word in Asia at a particular time. That tells me that Paul had a desire to go into Asia with the Word. The Holy Spirit said, no Paul, not now, not, you're not going to do this. And so again, even the Apostle Paul on some level wanted to do something but had no control over the Holy Spirit. He forbid him to go into Asia at that moment. And so looking back at verse 8 now, I want you to do something. And I'm going to read it, but I want you to think of this. I want you to take the word Spirit, take the Holy Spirit, and plug it in to where you see the word wind. This is what it would read like. The Holy Spirit blows where He wishes, and you hear His sound. But you don't know where He comes from or where He goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's what He's telling us there. The Spirit's moving. And let me tell you, when I preach, I would desire beyond anything that the Holy Spirit just blow us away. Just come in and just blow us away. But here's one thing I realize. Sometimes, the Holy Spirit's blowing across an individual is just enough to lift an eyelash that's fallen on your cheek. It's very faint, but it's exactly what that person needs. But there's other times 
where the Holy Spirit moves upon a heart and a soul like a hurricane. But that's exactly what that person needs. Same message, same truth, different people, different needs. One's a little closer to being nudged and one needs a big force behind it. But the Holy Spirit knows that. He knows your hearts. He's moving. He's active. He's blowing. There's a mystery to it. I can't see how the Holy Spirit's moving, but I can guarantee this. We see His effects. We see the evidence of Him moving on heart and on people. And as He does move on hearts and on people, please be aware, church, our enemy hates that. I can't tell you how many times, and it's a blessing if somebody comes and says, God is really speaking to me in this way. Be on guard at that moment. Because our enemy will move against that. He doesn't like to see God's activity. He doesn't like to see you growing in your faith and being radically changed by the Word of God. So just be aware of that. I mean, we live in a fallen world. Don't be surprised when that happens. But rejoice in it because there's activity in your life by God enough that our enemy takes notice and wants it to end. That's praiseworthy of God. He's moving. Our enemy doesn't move against things where he's not threatened. Realize that. That's how he works. He sees the threat. He moves in to snuff it out. But back in our text, verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? It's really interesting when you look at the progression of things that Nicodemus has said in this conversation. He comes to Jesus first and says, You're you're a teacher. We know you're from God. You're doing these works. No one could do it if God's not with him. And then Jesus says, okay, that's all well and good, but you've got to be born again, Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, well, how am I going to crawl back in my mother's womb? He's just, his mind is completely blown. But then he comes down to this last part where Jesus talks about the work of the Spirit involving this, that it's not through rabbi school, that it's not through memorization of the Old Testament that you have this new birth. And he comes to him and says, how? How can this be? He, he has, he's at a loss for words. That's all he says is, how? And I think that's a great question to answer out. How can this be? And then Jesus comes to verse 10 and says, Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet, you don't understand these things. That tells me one thing, well, two things. Number one, he should have understood these things. Because there's something in the Old Testament that he should have been teaching Israel that's there. And number two is we can find what Jesus is talking about. So, throughout this text, throughout the times we've been going through this, we've been mirroring uh, mirroring an Old Testament text from Ezekiel chapter 36. Well, now I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. And I'll give you a little time to get to that. But this is in the Old Testament. This is what Nicodemus, teacher of Israel should have been teaching His people. Now, the context of this is probably familiar to many of you. The subheading is the Valley of Dry Bones. We sing songs about this. But listen to what's being said, and I want you to to take the context of the conversation with Nicodemus, take the context of the Spirit, and plug that into what I'm about to read. So Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and He brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And He led me around them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. You know what a dry bone means? A very dry bone? No life. Dead, dead, dead bones. Verse 3, And He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, You know. And I think that what Ezekiel was meaning in that is, God, if You will it, they'll live. You know this, God. You're able, God. And then verse 4, Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Because, or behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause your flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. 
So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a sound, and behold, a rattling that's equated to like an earthquake. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now here's the interesting thing about that. Breath and spirit, same word there. So as he's prophesying to the breath, he's prophesying to the spirit, come upon these bones and realize that even though they had flesh upon them and they looked alive, they weren't alive yet until that breath, until that spirit entered into them. Same thing is so true of us today. There are people who are lost, and man, you know it. You see it. Their bones are dry, dry, dry. But then there's others who look alive, but spiritually they're dead. And the whole reason for both of those is that the Spirit must give life to them. Just as that breath was prophesied and moved upon them and gave them life, God has to give life. We've got to be born from above. And here's the beauty of that. Whether you're, as we would classify, really lost or even looking religious, you're lost all the same, but there's hope in that. There's hope. Because you stand in the same area as we all have stood. You must be born again. And by placing your faith in Christ, you shall be born again. Born of the Spirit, forever changed. The Spirit must breathe on you. And now you can go back to John chapter 3, and I'll read another verse. And now what we understand what Ezekiel was prophesying, what we understand as far as blowing, this, this blowing aspect and God giving life, the end of verse 8, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So it is. You may have come to Christ. You may have invited Jesus in your heart. Whatever you want to call it, that's been done. But what that is, is faith reaching out to the truth of the Gospel. Okay? That's what's happening there. You are reaching out in faith and embracing the truth of the Gospel. But what's happening through God's end of it is the Spirit is giving you life. You don't do that. You don't create that. Your flesh has no part in that. You reach out in faith, which is not a fleshly endeavor, and you take hold of the truth of the gospel that Jesus has died on the cross for your sins. You hear that message, and you believe it, and you trust in it, and you are given life. And there is truly such a mystery to it. And I want to I bring something personal and home in, into this Because as I meditated on this verse and meditated also on on Bob's passing, something came together for me. On the morning that he went home, I walked out on the porch. And it was kind of rainy, dark, and the wind just, just whipped through the trees. I mean, just immediately took me to this verse. And just was blown away, my mind amazed at the power and the force and the mystery of it. And I thought about Bob. And I thought about his, his waning moments here on this earth. And I thought about the wind. And over days, these things just kind of churned in my head. And I realized something. And it ties in with that verse from John chapter 6. While Bob's physical life was failing, and while his flesh was, was running out, if you want to call it that, the spirit that lived inside of him was not in conjunction with that. Does that make sense? The spirit inside of him was just as alive as it ever was. Though physically he couldn't see us. 
Though physically, I don't know if He was even hearing us, but I do know this, the Spirit inside of Him was alive and well and moving. And this, this broadened for me. The Spirit is not at all dependent upon our physicality, our physical nature, the things that are going on within us, which tells us that even if you have disabilities, the Spirit is not, he's not dependent upon those to come into you. It makes no difference. So whether somebody is able to speak or not, or able to hear or not, or see or not, or whether they have some sort of traumatic brain injury, the Spirit's not dependent upon that to move in someone's life, to move in someone's heart. Because flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And so as, yes, Bob's physical nature was coming to a close, his spiritual nature wasn't at all. In fact, it was thriving. It was building up inside. And to, to have that come together for me and to understand what I was seeing but what I wasn't seeing and what was taking place, it's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing to know that the Spirit is not dependent upon how well we're breathing or dependent upon how well this body's functioning. He's working completely independent of that. And so, now I want us to to give thanks and rejoice in that truth in our own lives. And I also want us to take a moment and to pray silently of how the Holy Spirit may take this message and how He chooses to, to blow across you with this. It may be easy and gentle and warm and loving. It may be convicting. I don't know how He chooses because there is a mystery to it, but I pray that He will. So let's close our eyes and bow our heads and, and silently ask the Lord, how do you want to sweep across me with this message? And I believe He'll, he'll be faithful to, to answer that prayer. It may not be in this moment, but He will. And so take a moment now and pray silently, and then I'll close this.